Wellfall is a 100% scientifically accurate story of a scuba diver who is swallowed by a sperm whale and has one hour of air to get out. So that's kind of the elevator pitch. Um, sort of what's going on beneath the hood is that the diver is has been searching for his father's remains. And that's when he gets swallowed by the whale. And in the whale's stomach, where most of the book takes place, injured and breathing methane and hallucinating, he begins to conflate his dead father with the whale and begins speaking to the father through the whale. And only by sort of reconciling with his father will he have the tools to possibly escape. My my curiosity to start out with is um, to the extent of your um, kind of personal experience with being in or near oceans or diving or anything that is kind of right. like the the contents of the book. Yeah. So yeah, I grew up in in Iowa. So all there were there were ponds, you know, um, and I didn't go in them very much. Uh, <laughs> I, I sort of have memories of being in a few ponds, but. Uh, ponds are kind of scary in their own way. Like I remember there being snakes in ponds and, uh, often there'd be little kind of swimming holes on someone's farm. they just seemed kind of suspect. Uh, I did live in North Carolina for four or five years right after college. Um, and that was the first time I ever saw the ocean because I lived right on the the coast in Wilmington, North Carolina. And, um, and, you know, I think for the first like few years out there, I did, I did try to take advantage of the beach. I, you know, I've never been a good swimmer. I've never been comfortable in the water. And of course the ocean is a whole other level of, uh, discomfort because you got the waves crashing in. And, um, I, I can kind of remember being in the ocean and feeling like a school of fish passed by, like against my legs. And I just got out. Like, I just, <laughs> like, there's nothing, there was no danger there, but I just didn't like it. Um, it sort of just reminded me that I don't know what's just under the surface here, you know? And, it, and if you're chest deep in water, well, that could be sharks. It could be anything. Um, yeah. So I, I've never been, I've never had a lot of comfort with the sea. I wouldn't say it's a full on phobia. But there is, I, would, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say I'm ashamed that I never really learned to swim. You know, I, I can kind of, I can dog paddle and I can tread water, but um, that's certainly not a point of pride uh, that I'm staying away from that. I always wish I had, I, I was better in the water. Yeah. Did, um all your research and, and stuff and writing the book, do anything to make you want to explore any more than uh, your current experience? Or are we still kind of like in the same place with your relationship with the ocean and stuff? I would say it did help me a little bit because I had to learn to scuba dive for it. Ah, um, yeah. There was just no way I could, I mean, my character's in a scuba suit and gear the entire book. So it, I needed to know what it felt like and what it sounded like and everything, you know, so I did, I did scuba dive. Um, and again, it wasn't something I was really looking forward to, but it was, it was pretty magical. I think we, we, or at least I, um, don't kind of recognize enough how miraculous it is. Like you are breathing underwater. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, those first couple breaths are scary because you don't know if you you know, I didn't know if I trusted the equipment. Would I just be getting a lungs full of, of uh, water? But it's amazing, and it is sort of like flying. You know, it's you are doing things. You are steering yourself almost as if you are a submersible. And it's the perfect, it ends up being the perfect thing for non-swimmers because you don't really need to know how to swim to scuba dive. Mm. You're, you've got the your BCD trigger, so, like, that's kind of, taking you up and down and then you just sort of steer with your legs and it's uh sort of the ideal situation for someone who's not a good swimmer um and it did make me um want to do it again so i assume at some point i will scuba dive again so at least there's that <laughs> that's that's good um yeah and 
that makes me think about so i know a guy who's like a scuba him and his wife are both like scuba instructors and they're you know really into that world and um between them and i have a, a high school friend who lives out in like berkeley who lives on his sailboat and um just loves being out in the water and when I think about the two of them, it's like they almost have like a different relationship with reality than like maybe something that I can understand. Like they have access to a world that I never look at. I never think about. So um, and I feel like you you kind of pulled that off with um, uh, the Mitt character in this book where he yeah. just had an entirely different viewpoint of um, of reality or, or the world that we live in because of his experience. Um diving and being you know in or near the ocean and stuff like that yeah like we're 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 i mean the land the dry land of the of the world is the tip of the iceberg you know like most of earth is beneath the water uh, yeah so that's that's kind of the real world we're, we're sort of the anomaly living out in the dry uh so you're, you're exactly right there is not only a different world but the main world is is in the water. And so people yeah. who, are privy, who are privy to that world, uh, it's almost as if they're communing with aliens or ghosts or an, an entire another plane of existence than the rest of us are. Yeah. Um, so for people listening, um, Whalefall, the main character is uh, Jay, uh, who is a young man whose father had recently passed away. His name's Mitt. And was a legendary um, diver in California, um, and so it, it like like you already said, the whole book basically takes place in this one dive um, that that Jay does. But yeah, so as the book goes along, Jay was uh, so we flash back. There's uh there's what's happening now in the in the present time, but you're also flashing back to um, Jay's kind of contentious relationship with his father um, throughout his childhood. And um, I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about the way it's written, the way it plays out is um, there's almost like a, we don't know, we don't get it. Like Jay didn't really maybe get it the way that his dad got it. And it's mm -hmm. hard to kind of see that in a different way. There's like kind of a revelatory kind of understanding where um, a lot of people take advantage of the ocean or nature or whatever. But once you really understand it, you want to protect it. You love it. You are kind of like in like reverent of it in a way. Yeah. And, and so that was a cool thing that you played with in the story. Yeah. It's almost like Mitt who's, who uh, is very vocal about his um, antagonism toward religion. Really. It's almost like he, his religion is the ocean. His gods are the, the whales and other creatures and he was trying to introduce his son to that religion and just did it very poorly. You know, he's like someone trying to push the religion on someone else. It's not, it doesn't really work like that. You have to find something in it that you connect with. Um, and that doesn't happen to Jay until he's been swallowed by a whale. <laughs> and then only then does he start to understand um, as a matter of pure survival what his father was was getting at you know like what are the sort of non-religious but still spiritual elements of the ocean right um and like i, I want to go in two directions with this conversation because obviously i want to talk about the father-son element um because there's so much there but also i want to talk about the whaley stuff um because that's that's intensely well done too um so I'll, I'll dip back over to the, the sea life part of it, the dive part of it. Um, but I definitely want to explore more of the father son um, element of it. Cause that's the whole like kind of like forward momentum of the, of the story. But um, so the book starts out, Jay is going to go on a dive where his father went into the ocean and um, ostensibly took his life um, after battling cancer. And, um, so not too long after it, it goes kind of sideways and everything. And, and he's swallowed by a whale, like you said. Um, and one of the things I noticed at the very beginning of the book where I was like, this is just going to chew my nerves up 
is that the way that you wrote it, the present tense chapters have, or the present, present tense, the present, the chapters that take place in the present have the PSI reading of like the, the air tank mm-hmm. <laughs> as like the chapter name. And I was like, this is just going to destroy my nerves. This is going to like kill me with anxiety. But I was of two minds of it. I was like, is he doing this to create um, like a, like a baseline of tension or is it just something that's so f- like on present of mind with a diver that like, that's just what they would be thinking at that moment. So, yeah. or was it both? Well, yeah, it was both. Um, and it's amazing how much form sort of affects function in, in all my books, but particularly this one, um, because as a, as a diver, you're always going to be hyper aware of the, the PSI of your tank, more or less how much air you have left. Um, and I wanted that to be ever present in the same way that if you were a diver, you'd always be kind of glancing at it. So that led me to want to create short chapters. And typically I write books that have somewhere between, I don't know, normal size chapters and kind of long chapters. I tend to be a denser type of writer. So I've never done anything that where my chapters are, you know, one or two or three pages long. But I wanted to do that so I could have the constant ticking down of the PSI. Um, and that that created the whole pace and structure of the book by accident. Like that made me <laughs> yeah. realize that, okay, I'm going to have these bite-sized chapters. This is going to also now permit me to jump back and forth in time uh, with regularity, but never very long. Like these aren't 20 page flashbacks, they're one or two page flashbacks. Uh, So it created this whole rhythm and pattern uh, that really began to to mirror sort of the mindset of the character once, particularly once he's swallowed, he's really, as you you would be, kind of panicking and his mind is kind of spinning to what's happening now and things he might be trying to remember that would help him get out of this. so yeah, the the PSI thing really led to a lot of how the book was written, really. Yeah. That and then like switching to a flashback, which it wasn't necessarily like one and then the other. Sometimes there was multiple chapters of, you know, um the dive and then it would jump back to a flashback depending on what was going on in his head. Um for me as a reader, the the chapters that were the flashbacks it was like I got to go up for air mm-hmm, and get yeah. away from that claustrophobic feeling of not only being, you know, in the perspective of someone who's been swallowed by an enormous animal, but also a person who's worried about their supply of air. So going back to a flashback was like, ooh, I can re- I can relax for a second. It was almost like a physical change in like the way that I felt when I was reading those parts. Totally. It is it is it is intentionally like getting a quick breath of air, but then you're right back down again. Yeah. Yeah. That was really cool. In, okay. So in your, um, kind of afterward or your, your author's notes at the end, you acknowledge like the, the extent of all the research that you, you did. And like, um, the, uh, um, the people that were helping you, the experts that you got to access and everything. Um, like, was that, I would find that terribly challenging. And there's probably one really strong reason that I'm an author is that, um, that is intimidating to me, but I could see that there would probably be a lot of fun in hitting someone up with an email and saying, Hey, here's where I'm at. What if X, Y, Z, and then like having them explain to you, no, this is impossible because of this. Is that, was that more of the fun part of it or, or like a slog that you had to get through? Uh, well, you know, I've, I've come over the years to really love research. I do a, a ton of research on most of my books. Every once in a while, there's one that doesn't quite much um and i've i've found the reason i've come to love it so much is that i find that the research changes the the stories and the plots radically once i dig into the research i find new ideas and it it really positively affects just the story of the book um this was a really dramatic case in which i had no i could come up with nothing because there's no books about this um yeah books about sort of whale behavior and stuff like that but there's there's nothing. I can't write a book about what happens inside a whale because there's there's no there's nothing to tell me. Like, so I had no choice but to begin with whale experts, and it wasn't. And I couldn't even 
just email well expert for some facts. Like I needed to sit with some well experts for a long time and talk about a lot of things. Um, and it was like, I, it was almost as if I was inside the whale myself and had a little flashlight, you know, and I'd point it somewhere and I'd be like, okay, what's over here? And my mm -hmm. experts would say, well, that, that's this. And I'd say, what does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it, you know, can you touch, what happens if you touch it? Uh, what, what's over here? What if my diver crawls this way? And so painstakingly slowly, I would start to understand the geography of the whale um, through their descriptions and through photos and through diagrams. They would draw me sort of live over Zoom. Uh, and there was no way to come up with even a ghost of a plot until, uh, until I stumbled across plot elements with them as they sort of took me on this guided tour over a few months. And it was usually me prodding them with questions about things that they knew about. Like they, and they loved it. That was the key. If they had hated this, the conversation <laughs> would have been over very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> my, and I used a lot of experts in a lot of different realms, but my, I had a core three oil experts that I used constantly. And they were just very excited by the concept. Um, it really got them thinking creatively too. Uh, like they knew the inside of the whale's best as anyone alive, but they'd never thought about certain pieces of anatomy in the way I was asking them to think about, you know, this, this, this piece of, you know, the throat, could someone hang on to it? Could someone hold it? Well, what would happen if they held it and what would it feel like? And could you find this certain tendons or whatever? It would go on and on. And piece by piece, I began putting together a plot because he, my diver is only going to have about an hour of air. I basically had to know it was the book was was doomed or destined to be a real time story. So I needed to know what was happening every minute of that book. And I couldn't really start writing it until I knew everything. So it was a it was a long upfront process of learning everything before I could really get to writing it at all. Yeah. And you made a good point. Um and it's something that I think is is acknowledged by Jay in the course of the book is that there's really not someone who's been fully swallowed by a whale and then come out to tell their story. So yeah, you don't have, you can't just copy and paste something from, you know, something you read in a news article you can get so far and then it's conjecture. So um, I guess artistic license has to take, you know, take the, the wheel here and there at some point. Um, but um yeah, I guess I would imagine that it would, the people that you were relying on had a kind of like, well, our best guess is this would happen in certain parts of it, right? Yeah, I mean, they would, the biggest allowance they gave me was just that sperm whales are truly one of the most mysterious animals on the planet. Um, and so I, they would sometimes comfort me by saying, you have a little bit of license because even <laughs> we aren't 100% sure on how all these things work. Uh, but my goal was to be as 100% accurate as humanly possible um, because that was the whole fun challenge of it for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I had some of these people read the drafts of the book and I had diving experts read drafts of the book. So it's everything has been checked and double checked within our human ability to be accurate. But, um, yeah, it's... I mean, no one, this has never happened to anyone. You know, like you, yeah. you read the headlines about people being swallowed by whales occasionally, like a viral video or something, but those headlines are completely misleading. Uh, most whales and the whales that show up in these viral videos are baleen whales, humpback whales. Uh, they have tiny throats. They, they're the size of soup cans. There's no way these are swallowing you. Occasionally people will get mouthed by whales and sort of immediately spit out. Uh, but no one, I'm relatively reasonably certain that no one has ever been swallowed by a whale, but it's possible. If it was a sperm whale, it's possible. Is it weird that it's comforting that most whales that we would encounter couldn't actually swallow us? Like you saying that made me feel like, well, well at least, at least I'll likely get spit out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the spitting, I mean, it's gonna, still going to be pretty scary and the spitting <laughs> is, is likely to break some bones. Like you you know, these are massive creatures, so uh, <laughs> you, may, you may break some bones. Um, you know, there's 
most of the whales that could ever mouth, you don't have teeth, so that you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but you could also just get smashed under a breaching whale, and that could, that could in theory, kill you too. So these are all things you want to avoid. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when we're in the water, we're not, we're not in our territory anymore. We are in the sea life's territory. So if you're going out there swimming or kayaking or whatever, it's, you know, you're the trespasser. So there's no, you have to take those risks. At face yeah. Value. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we don't necessarily know unless we are kind of like seagoing people in general. Um, what the danger is maybe, but so I'll give a, 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 an example. I was visiting my friend, Sean in Berkeley and I've never been on sailboats or anything really in my life. And we're sailing out of the Harbor and we're heading toward like the break, the breakwater thing, that like line of rocks that breaks the water. And he just like stops doing stuff. And he's like, I'm going to tell you what to do, but you have to navigate us through this. And I was like, the fuck are you talking about? And he's like, you're taking over, man. You have to do this right now do it right now. And he wouldn't help. And he's like, if you don't do this, we're going to hit those rocks. <laughs> and all of a sudden, like I was panicking and I was like, this is like a crazy situation. And he guided me, guided me through it. And he's just kind of like a weird, weird dude like that. But, um, I was like, Oh, we're out for a nice stroll around the Bay and this is totally safe. And, and this is a fun, exciting thing. And then he introduced this element of like, Oh, like there's some real scary stuff that could happen if we're not responsible and we're not, aware of what we need to do. We don't do things the right way. So that was one of my quick. And then we, we were sailing at night in the bay and he's like, yeah, those big tanker ships have like one light at the front and one light at the back. So you could accidentally run right into the side of one and not even realize yeah. it. And I was like, oh, there's stakes that I never thought of before. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like a lot of people who aren't in that world and, and have to have that reverence for it don't even realize what the dangers really are. Yeah, you could be swimming and come across like a, a baby whale or something, and then and they're you know they're they're peaceful animals that they have no interest in in hurting humans. Uh, but uh, if you got hit by the the flap of their tail or fin wrong, they could shatter your bones. And not to yeah. mention with sperm whales, their echolocational powers are so strong that if they sort of clicked at you, your your body could go numb. There's stories of divers who like. You know, were clicked at by a baby whale, and they, you know, their arms were essentially dead for hours. Like these are just <laughs> beings that have almost these supernatural powers. Um, but they're, you know, they're they're friends of us, really. But they they don't operate like we do in any way. Yeah, yeah. Um, another element that we touched on a little bit was, and you said it was basically this was going to be a real time story. Uh, because when we're with Jay in the whale and, and going through what he's going through, there's a little, there's a literal clock counting down. So the book takes place over the course of, you know, for the most part, like an hour and a half or two hours, um, total. And I love that kind of story. I love it where, um, it all just happens all at once. So the first thing I think of is, I think I actually have it on my shelf, um, survivor song by Paul Tremblay is a book that takes place over the course of like six or seven hours at the, in this weird kind of, you know, extreme rabies outbreak. Um, and the thing I love about those types of stories is that there's just constant forward momentum. Um, yeah. and you stay like, you never get a break really. So your, your flashbacks to a degree were like, like you said, that quick breath of air, but then you're right back in it. Um, but the, like the pacing feels like you just, it's, it's just, constant momentum like the brakes are off and you just you're hurtling toward the end so um and you said that you typically write kind of more more dense stuff so was this kind of a departure from from your your typical pace yeah i mean i've written one other book i can think of that's um more or less real time it's not a thriller like this at all um actually a couple books that i've written that are kind of real time but but nothing like this where we're talking about 90 minutes and every <laughs> every second in breath of air is precious i've always been really attracted to stories that are either set in very minimal locations or stories that uh, are set 
in real time because I think those are really interesting challenges, and I think they 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 push any artist to kind of show you what they're made of. You know, like it's I'm not even a huge Tarantino fan, but like when he made the Hateful Eight, it was sort of like you know, like this guy has the budget to do whatever he wants, but he's he's <laughs> going to choose to do a story that's all set in one location, like. And I and I appreciate that uh, because it's it's putting you back in the the mix with like everyone else. Like anyone can shoot a movie that takes place in one location with a few actors uh, or write a book like that. So it's it's putting you it's taking away all your abilities to to do wild stunts and saying can do you just really have the stuff to um, limit your resources like this. So you yeah. don't have. There's no places. You're, you're no place else. Your character can go. Uh, there's no t- no like you. You forget as an author how much you rely on time breaks, chapter breaks, mm-hmm. page breaks. Uh, <laughs> one day later, one week later. I mean, this stuff is second nature to authors. But when you take it all away, it's it really feels like it's just you and the page, and no one's there to help you, uh, and, and you have no more tricks to use. You just have to write your ass off. Uh, so that was all part of the the thrill of, of writing this, to see if you, I could pull it off. Yeah. Well, um, that was a thought that I had because the the tie between what's happening uh, to Jay in the present and the flashbacks is um, you had kind of mentioned it before. He's in a situation where now he has to try and think of what do I know that can help me in this situation. Um so I have to imagine that was probably a tough balancing act of like, in order to move the plot along, I have to tap into this experience so that he can have the knowledge he needs to just try something. Um, so it yeah. had to be difficult to kind of work that all together, weave it together in a way that doesn't impact the pace, doesn't damage the pace, yeah. but makes it all make sense. Yeah, that was probably the biggest challenge. Like in in a sense, Jay is kind of acting as a a little MacGyver inside yeah. the whale. Like there, whales swallow all sorts of stuff, so there are a few objects that are inside of a whale. Um, but the idea was that for every piece of, but for every object that he would use and every piece of knowledge that he would have to put into use, there was going to be some emotion connected to it. Like it wasn't mm-hmm. just. I'm going to grab this thing here and grab this here, put them together and make this new thing. It was that every piece of information he needed to survive came from his father, who he had spent a lifetime trying not to listen to because he didn't like who his dad was. He didn't like the relationship. He didn't want to be like his dad. And so he had tried to, you know, his dad kind of pushed him into this, into the sea, almost literally trying to get him to love the sea. Like, like he did. And the son was like, because of how you treat me, I'm going to go the other way. I hate the sea. Uh, So to to pull back those pieces of knowledge that his dad had given him, uh, makes each one of those pieces laden with um, anger and grief and regret. Um, It makes them all powerful. And there's no way he can really obtain them without some kind of mental reconciliation. And so really what's happening in this book is Jay and his father slash the whale who sort of becomes embodies his father. They have this reconciliation, like, like they both treated each other poorly and they're going to have to make peace and quickly and profoundly. If Jay's going to get out of there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's really power. And I got to imagine that this is probably going to be interesting, depending on because when you talk to people about this, everybody's got everybody's got their relationship with their father. So there's it's kind of hard to not think of where where am I with this situation? What like you, you reflect on yourself? One of the things I kind of noticed was that um, because of you, some, you know you summarized that very well. But one of the things that I was kind of thinking as I was reading it was like he might not have been fully aware of what was going on as far as reconciling things or, or the, the concept of forgiveness because dudes like convinced he's going to die and trying to like survive. So there was a subtle kind of gradual change to 
understanding what was going on that I think you pulled off, I think quite well. Yeah. I mean, thanks. As you were asking, like it, that was the biggest challenge is going back and forth between present and past in a way that felt um, natural and didn't feel disruptive. Um, there was a, a temptation to always tie his memories to something that was happening in the moment. Um, like, I don't know, let's say he picks up a piece of glass that the whale swallowed and then he's going to have a memory about glass. Um, that, that does happen in the book. And this was a, something my, my editor and I discussed during the, the, the editing phase, but it felt a little false to me to always have there to be a launching pad like that. Uh, it, it made more sense to me that your brain is going to be spinning. Um, and sometimes the thing right in front of you inside that whale stomach is going to make you think of something specific, but other times you, your brain is just going to be on fire and you're going to be just in utter survival mode. Um, mm -hmm. And the difficulty in, in writing it, not that really it's anyone's, you know, who cares how I wrote it, but it is that with that pattern of constantly jumping through time, it created dom a domino effect. Uh, so if I were to say, I'm going to move this, this one flashback from this book, it screws up everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> because it's the pattern of, of past and present gets thrown off all the weight of all the, the sort of balances you put in get it's thrown off. Uh, in a real time book, there's information is delivered at very specific times. And if you screw any of those up, everything makes stops making sense. Yep. So that was really, the, I mean, it was hard to do the research. Yes. It was, that was almost like taking a class though. Like I took a class in advanced whales. <laughs> that <were a> class. <laughs> uh, it's something I can sort of put my arms around and do that. Uh, the writing I've got, I've written a lot of books. I sort of understand that. Uh, what was challenged was the biggest challenge was editing it in a way that all the flashbacks back and forth always felt exciting because right. there's nothing worse than reading a book and, and having a flashback and being like, Oh God, we got to go back to this again. I was really into that other thing. And now we're, they're dragging us back to 1958 and who cares what happened in 1958. So that was a, that was a constant concern, you know, but yeah. hope that pulled that off. Okay. No, I think, I think it was one of the strengths of the book. Um, and then, so speaking about where the book came from originally and tying it into the fact that we're talking about the father or something, um, reading in the, the, you know, stuff you wrote at the end of the book, um, you had seen one of those viral videos of kayakers or whatever. So my, my impression finishing reading this book was this guy's got a lot to talk about when it comes to family and, and, you know, father son relationships. And then I read that stuff and I was like, Oh, he was inspired by this video where a whale, you know, well, you know, scoops of, up these yeah. people. So then I was like, where does this father son relationship stuff come from? Or like, how did that become an element of the book? Um, for well, you? Neither answer is wrong. It's all, it's all stuff. <laughs> like all my books. I've come to really think about my books as um, usually a cross between two ideas. Uh, sometimes it's more, um, but generally it's almost two. And sometimes that will take me decades. I'll, like, I'll have a concept and then I'll think about it year after year after year. And then one day I'll stumble across a second concept that crosses with it. And yeah. it's almost like two things hitting and making a spark. Uh, and in the, the case of whale fall, um, it didn't take decades or years. It was almost instantaneous. Uh, I had... You know, when I heard about the viral video, before I'd even seen it, I had the idea for the book. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, but then, you know, in theory, it could take years for me to figure out that, that element that crosses with it that makes it a book and not just a, a note. Um, and for me, that was this, this family relationship, which is something that's always kind of lingering in my head. Just, uh, you know, we've all got our sort of you know, personal obsessions that are based on things in our, in our past or just things we're interested in. 
and I'd written about kind of complicated um, parent-child relationships before, but I'd always done it in a sort of obscure way, kind of going around it a little bit, and it's and it worked. Uh, but I found the premise of this story when I came up with it so immediately powerful, uh, and I thought to myself. I cannot believe no one's ever done this, written this before, <laughs> yeah. and I think I think this is going to activate people's brains in a way that a few premises do. I think I think there's something in our primordial brain that remembers when we used to be a being that had to worry about being swallowed and eaten by things, and certainly the idea when I when I had it just set my brain on fire the, that whole night when I came up with the idea. And so I wanted to match that with something equally simple and powerful. And that I, so I didn't want to overthink it because the guy swallowed by whale is such a simple, powerful concept that is so, so like essential to us as humans that it's in all, it's in the Bible, it's in myth and story and lore and Disney movies. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to match it with something simple, powerful, and to me, that was this father-son relationship, which just spoke to me in a, in a really immediate, strong way. And I thought I could just write the hell out of it, right, not around it this time, but right through the center. Um, and I, I just was was banking on the simplicity of it in a way. Yeah. Yeah, you really just bore down on it. And there was a, I'm the type of person who, um, uh, with the, the media that I consume, I'm really, there's certain things that I feel like I have to be prepared for if I'm going to go into this thing. Um, and father son relationships is definitely one of those ones that I'm like, I'm not super excited about exploring that. Cause then it makes me think of my own situation. Um, and so this was, this was like me sitting there being like, God damn it. I'm going to have to think about this now. So, um, yeah, I'm then, getting that know, a lot. Yeah. And that's, that, that was going to be where I was going. But like, um, so like for me, as this is going on, I'm like, man, I am Jay in this situation. Like, you know, fuck this dude, all that kind of stuff. And as the story's going on, it's slowly dawning on me. Like, do I have to question how I'm reacting? Like, am I really going to have to confront that? Like there could be other reasons that things, you know, and like, so it really did push me to yeah, question myself. So um, I have to imagine that if you had, like you said, you've kind of already gotten that, but, you, are you prepared for for people to come up and say you really made me think about my relationship with my father? Yes, it, it is really happening a lot. I think this is. I don't know if it's not written about enough or what. <laughs> um, this kind of this kind of exact relationship, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, it's. I think when people pick this up, they expect a a nail biting thrill ride, and I think it is that. But what I don't think they expect is that they're going to be crying by the end of it. Like I get yeah. so many people saying I was in tears for the last 50 pages. And and I think it's because it's just, it's somehow scraping at a wound that a lot of us have bandaged up and kind of thought was healed enough. Um, yeah. And I think, I think why the book is, why it's working in the way you just said is that, it's not a book that says, "Oh, if you had problems with your dad, it's all your dad's fault." Like it's not. It's not saying that at all. It's saying everyone has a part to play in the their relationships. Yep. Um, it there. I think if you're, you know, an adult, um, maybe if you even have your own kids, I think there's parts in this book where you're going to be like, "I'm Jay," and then there might be suddenly a part where you're like, "No, wait, I'm Mitt." Um, yep. So it's it's a it's not a book that le lets anyone off the hook, um, mm -hmm. and I think that in itself is surprising. I think it was surprising as a writer of the book. I think it's surprising as a reader of the book, um, and I think it just it somehow makes palpable something that we feel and don't talk about a lot. Um, yeah, and, I, and I, some of that just feels like alchemy. Some of it feels like magic, like. I don't even know exactly how the book does it exactly, but it just sort of does. It, it, it felt like that when writing it. And I didn't even, I wasn't ever even sure constantly why it was, 
working so effectively, but I was writing it and feeling all sorts of things. Yeah. Well, I think that the way that you made us so intimately connected to Jay from the very beginning, um, we as readers are just so like locked in with this dude. We are this dude, like we're, we are this person. So as these things start surfacing, we naturally kind of line up with that. We align with it. And then as things progress, it's like, I I don't, I don't know. For me, it was just, I was so like unquestionably Jay through the thing that as these bigger questions start coming up and, and, and stuff like that, then it was like, I was going through the questioning that maybe was intended for Jay too. So I think that if you didn't have us so locked in with that protagonist at the beginning, it might've been a different outcome. Yeah. I mean, there's a point, I mean, to sort of like talk a little bit more for listeners, like the issue was that, you know, Mitt treated Jay quite badly in a lot of ways. Um, And then when Mitt got sick, um, you know, with cancer dying, Jay wouldn't show up. He wouldn't come to his bedside. He wouldn't visit him. Um, And you sort of, you sort of get it. You're like, yeah, this guy was a total psychopath to Jay. I don't blame him for not going to his father and letting his father have some sort of closure. But then before the books end, you start to doubt that a little bit, you know, like there's a reason. And a lot of this goes back to, to the book of Jonah, but there's a reason the first book, first half of the book is called truth. And the second half is called mercy. Uh, and which of those at the end of the day is more important and more powerful is really the essential question that the book is wrestling with. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. So incredibly done. Um, the people that, um, I've seen talk about it. So Becky Spradford, is just raving about it. She's, uh, she's been on the podcast. She's, I, I love her. She's, if, if she says something good about a book, I do not question it. Um, Sadie Hartman, is, I think she said it was really high up to be her favorite book of the year, which by the way, she reads like 150 to 200, 200 books a year. Or so, um, <laughs> high praise, but yeah. Um, and you've recently posted, uh, a bunch of, you know, stuff about what, what you're hearing about it. And, um, so it's obvious that this book is having an effect beyond just it's a scary whale book or whatever. Like there is a significant like impact that it's having to the people who are reading it. Yeah, so. it is. It is. And like I said, it, you know, it's my 21st book. So I don't say this lightly, but it has it had an impact on me that I don't, my other books don't like it. Yeah. It felt all the while writing it, particularly writing maybe the last 50 to 75 pages just felt like one of those things where it's, it's like, I hate cheesy writer stuff like this, that it's just like wrote itself or was flowing out of you. Um, (laughs) I don't believe in that stuff. I believe in hard work. That's all I believe in. But it, it got as close to that as it ever feels like. It just felt like in some ways, this was the book I've been training to write so that when the idea came across my brain, it just, it was all there just waiting yeah. And it almost it's funny because it almost feels like the premise of the whole book paints you into a very tight corner. So it's interesting to hear that it it kind of came more fluidly than maybe you had expected it to. Yeah, I mean I think the the feelings of the book were all were all there in me and and all I had to figure out was uh the mechanics, which were very complicated and involved me taking essentially a class in Wales. Like that <laughs> part, there was, a, there were a huge hurdle for me to get there, but I, I had this hunch from day one that if I could, if I could get together a team that can help me figure out the geography of the interior whale and how whales behave and what's all that stuff that there, this is a, an engine for something really powerful that, I think, I think it's going to like, I think it's going to really take people by surprise. I think it's going to yeah. move them in ways that they're not expecting. And, um, and you never know until the book comes, starts rolling out and you start hearing it. And then it's, um, it's a very strange experience. Mm-hmm. The whole rollout of this book has been odd 
and unusual and peculiar and gratifying, I guess, but um, revelatory, I guess. It, it kind of makes me think that we all, that a lot of us have similar scars and I don't think we realize it. Um, and, and, I, and again, this book kind of takes pains to say those scars aren't necessarily any one person's fault. Um, mm -hmm. It's like somebody has to have the knife, but somebody has to hold out their arm in some ways. And that's not always the case. Like there are some just terrible people out there who do terrible things and that's the end of the sentence. But I think that for a lot of us who lived under slightly less dramatic circumstances, um, it's, it's way more complex than that. Human, human relationships are just really complicated and they, they linger for lifetimes. And there's something, there's something about the, the whale as a vehicle for that, that felt spiritual almost, I'm not a religious guy, but felt almost religious. Like, mm -hmm. like they're under their giant and unfathomable, just like angels would be in the sky. They're just these, they, they are, they are a, a, a thing that could host a coming to terms like these characters in a way that nothing else could. And the fact that it's all real and that it could all happen, yeah. it just, it just, yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. And then I like that central kind of thought of the two different things, the truth and the mercy, right. Mm -hmm. Being kind of the bigger question of it. Um, and it's one of those things that it's like one of those things that's so specific that even though I haven't, you know, had a diver dad who, you know, threw himself in the ocean and I go looking for his remains, get swallowed by a whale. I feel like my experiences in life, I can see them in what's going on in, in his mind and stuff. So yeah, it's a really relatable tale that I think could, yeah, help people kind of try a new perspective on what's, what's going on in their, their hearts or whatever. Yeah. I think it's what you always want to do with fiction and you very, yeah. you so rarely do is that it's a very, very specific story and yet it taps into something extremely universal. Yep. Um, yeah. And so like you, I've, None, none of the specifics in the story line up with me whatsoever. But, <laughs> yeah. And yet everything in the book is about me at the same time. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's cool when you can pull that off effectively, but also in a story, let's not, because I, I, I leaned toward like the, the serious and the significant stuff of the book, but like it's really entertaining and it's fast paced and it's a great read. So um, I just want to zoom out a little bit from okay. all of like the deeper stuff to say that, um, you know, overall, this book is really entertaining and, and strongly written and it's got a great pace to it. And, you know, so there's that too. There's, there's all that deeper exploration, but it is, it's, it's a fun, exciting story too. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, you're right. I don't want to, uh, get so <laughs> lost in, in the weeds that, you know, people don't think about that people lose sight of who are thinking about reading the book. This is about a guy dealing with the teeth of a giant whale and yeah. being in the throat of the whale. What's that like? And being inside the stomach and the, the, a sperm whale chews with his stomach. So it's getting crushed. This guy's getting crushed. And so what does he do? You know, he moves forward and there's a second stomach and the second stomach is filled with melting squid. It's like an acid bath. So there's really all these, in, if there's a whole other word of it, we're, as angelic as whales are in some ways. And I do believe they are uh, the inside of whales like hell. Like yeah. it's just one chamber of hell that leads to another worse chamber. Uh, so if, if you're not interested in all the family stuff, that's fine. This is a, <laughs> yeah. a house of horrors that this guy is sort of locked in. Um, yeah. Not by any ill will by the whale. The whale has no interest in hurting this guy, but his biology is what it is. And he's stuck in it. Yep. Yeah. Moving away from the specific of the story, you recently posted your your tour uh, that you're doing, so you're actually moving around the country a bit for this one. Um, I'm lucky enough that I'll be able to get to one of the Chicago area things, but you've got stuff going on uh, all over the place as well, right? Yeah, yeah, big tour. Um, um, twenty, I think all told, maybe twenty five stops, something like that. Yeah, and you've got some. So sometimes it's you doing like talking and signing, but sometimes you're, you're paired up with, um, some really cool names. So Jillian, Fr excuse me, Jillian Flynn, 
for Chicago, for one of the Chicago uh, situations, um, Stephen Graham Jones you're meeting up with. Um, there's a bunch of really cool names that are on there. So um, that's exciting too. I, I, I always lament that I have this Midwestern kind of location because I never get to see these cool events. So I'm really happy yeah. that I get to. Yeah. It's yeah. For some reason, authors don't, who aren't from Chicago don't tend to come here very often. So, <laughs> uh, but I have a, I have a pretty significant Midwest chunk of the tour. Like I've got, yeah. I've got Cleveland and St. Louis. And like you said, a few in Illinois, I've got Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, which aren't really Midwest, but they're, to creep in that way a yeah, little, yeah. Creep in there, yeah. <laughs> um, and then one thing I like to point out is um, you. So for pre-orders, because I really like to push people to pre-order books or like yeah, push their yeah. libraries to get it and stuff like that. So that's one of the main reasons that I do this podcast is, hey, this book is coming. Pre-order, pre-order. You're doing. Um, if you want to do personalized pre-orders, it's with um, Exile in Bookville, uh, yeah. in Chicago, right? So you already posted the information that on your social media, but I'll make sure that I make it suit. I actually already have it on my links to my, no, I don't, but I'll make sure that that's the focus. Cause I love supporting the locals and the indie people. Yeah. So if, if authors well, are doing this, I love this trend. There's, there's yeah. two ways to do it. If you want the book personalized, order it from exile in bookville in Chicago. But if you just want a uh, signed book plate and it comes, they put in your book that you buy from anywhere you want. Um, then you just have to go to this uh, website. It's you'll find it on my socials, um, but there's a website on that's hosted by Simon and Schuster that um, you just. It's very simple. You just enter your data of your address and stuff, and where you bought your book, and they'll send you for free a signed book plate and a signed uh, bookmark. So kind of regardless of where you order it, you can get it signed. You just that's but awesome. it, it's just for pre-orders. So yeah. once the um, once it's on sale, then there's that that deal is off. You can always order from Exile. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'll definitely make sure that that's something that people because that's always nice to have. It's nice. Um, it's nice to have the, the sign stuff. I like having the sign stuff. So cool. Well, uh, I definitely want to thank you for uh, taking the time. I had a real rocky road of getting you on here because I completely lost <laughs> our correspondence knife. So it, it's been, um, I've had a lot rockier, so that was fine. <laughs> That's great. And um, yeah, good luck on the release of whale fall. I'm looking forward to, um, you know, at some point shoving a book in your hands and being like sign more than you, you know, it already is um, yeah. along your yeah. tour. Um, and yeah, I just appreciate your time. It's been great talking to you and learning more about this book. Yeah. Come to the Jillian Flynn thing. If you can, it's going to, I'm going to be doing this really cool. I think it's cool in a way sort of like presentation that has like with, with a slide presentation, like history oh, yeah. of being swallowed and it's kind of neat. Um, there is probably going to be, it was supposed to be in the tour and then had to get postponed because of renovations, but there was going to be an event at shed aquarium oh, uh, wow. with actual whales there. <laughs> um, they end up rent, they end up having to renovate that space. So that event is going to happen at some point, like, but it'll be next year. I have no idea when. Uh, so there's that. If you somehow don't make the Jillian Flynn at some point next year, there'll be a, a <laughs> very cool. Awesome. I didn't even mention the beer. There's a beer. I'll post about it. Um, <laughs> right. because I, I gotta let you go, but I'll, I'll put it in my post. There's a whole beer that exists for this too, which is pretty cool. 